RX Television on RxMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your weekly 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, professionals, species products, whatever's on your mind, it is all on the table as now. We are officially one month away from the Olympia, Dave, as we are about to kick off our iron road to the Olympia and a lot for our viewers to expect over the course of the next four weeks. Yeah, well, this is the fun part. You know, the, 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 I always say, and I mentioned this on another show, that it, it's, it's more exciting the lead up to the show sometimes than the actual show weekend itself. On the Olympia side of things, though, I think the, nothing is as exciting as when you get to the Olympia. So... I think that it's important that people understand who's in the show, what the matchups are. You know, we're in the industry, so we take all this for granted. We know all the matchups. A lot of people, they don't really start tuning in until around Olympia time, and then they want to know, well, who's, who are the battles? Who's, who's the, you know, controversies? And that's what we're going to be covering in this next month leading up to the Mr. Olympia competition. I want to thank Yamamoto Nutrition for obviously sponsoring all our coverage. We'll be out there covering their booth and all the excitement out there in Las Vegas come the middle of September. But these next four weeks, look for, and if you guys have suggestions of people that you'd like to hear us interview, topics you'd like us to, to, to basically talk about, put them in the comments below, you know, because I want to give you guys the best coverage possible of the 2017 Olympia. Uh, Chris and I and uh, John Romano will be doing a lot of analysis. We'll probably be bringing uh, Lee Priest on for a lot of analysis as well as King Kamali. So, Stay tuned. We've got a lot to do over the next four weeks. We're going to be expanding on our show versus where we pit uh, bodybuilder versus bodybuilder. So it's going to be virtual previews of the 2017 Olympia. That and, of course, Iron Debate and live with the Iron Road to the Olympia coming soon next week to rxmuscle.com. Let's get to the questions. We first go to Brooks Clark. Dave, would you have preferred if you had and social media during your bodybuilding career, or do you think it helped you by having no social media distraction? It's a good question. I think about that a lot. I, I know that if we had social media and we had cell phone video cameras, I probably would have a lot more crazy you know, footage of myself at like 300 plus pounds, lifting some crazy, crazy ass weights. Uh, it would probably be nice to have it on video, and I'm sure I probably, my social media following would probably be a lot bigger than it is now if, if I had had that back then. But, you know, everything happens in due time, so, uh, you know, maybe it would have been a big distraction. Maybe I would have been too concerned about, you know, chronicling everything I was doing, and I wouldn't be so focused on actually doing what I was doing. So, there's a, there's a benefit, there's a, there's a negative, you know, and I think you have to just say it happened the way it was supposed to happen, you know. Let's go to the Atomic Beast. Dave, Dorian Yates made a distinction on the Joe Rogan podcast that he attributed his hard, grainy look to lifting very heavy weight around six to eight reps compared to bodybuilders now who have, quote unquote, softer muscle and do a lot of reps to achieve their size. Do you think his grainy look was genetic or does heavy lifting grow denser muscle tissue? Yeah, I don't think it's a necessarily a density of the muscle tissue. I think it's just he had more muscle tissue than guys have today. A lot of guys, what he was referring to, are very pumped up looking. Whereas he, you know, before he would start his diet or when he got down to about six weeks out, Dorian would be 290. And I'm telling you, it was a good 290. It was a 290 that if you saw that on stage, you'd probably be like, well, it's almost as better than what the, we see on stage today from a lot of these guys. But Dorian would, because he had so much muscle tissue, he would diet so severely that he would get every ounce of fat not only under the skin, but on inside and between the muscle fibers so that he would look so dense and grainy and hard. And, and I think that was an advantage he was able to take because a lot of guys, if they dieted that severely, they would look too skinny or too small on stage. But he had so much mass on his body, he was able to do that. I was able to do that as well. I had a very good metabolism, but I was able to take my weight down from 300, where I was pretty lean, and, and come in at 270 or 265 and still be big but super dense and grainy and I think that that's that's something that people aren't willing to do nowadays look I've helped natural bodybuilders that got on stage at 145 pounds and had the graininess of Dorian Yates they just weren't as big so anyone can get grainy and anyone can get hard it's just a matter of how much you're willing to suffer 
Keek Estrella, Dave, could you recommend some of the most essential supplements that a man over 50 should take? It's the same list pretty much as I give to, to everyone. And that's number one, very high potency, absorbable, multivitamin, multimineral. Uh, I recommend the Mineralize, my species nutrition uh, line of uh, multivitamin, multimineral, because I know it's in there. It has high potency uh, um, amounts uh, and quantities of all the vitamins you need in the right dosages. All the minerals, all the minerals are chelated, meaning they are using the most absorbable forms of these minerals. Chelated means bound to amino acids. They cleave off in the stomach and get absorbed. I have fruit and vegetable extracts in there to help with antioxidants and polyphenolics. Uh, that's the most important thing you should probably take. Secondly, I would take an extra dose of vitamin D. You probably need, in total, 7,000 units of vitamin D a day. If you take V-mineralize, you can add 5,000 more to that and you've got your total. Um, but those two are very important. And then the third most important uh, nutrient you should be taking in, in supplemental form is essential fatty acids. Those are your omega-3s and 6s. You don't need large amounts of them, but you do need effective dosages of them. Uh, you need to take an animal source of, uh, of omega-3s, preferably some kind of a fish oil a pill or krill oil or whatever you know, type of oil pill, uh, at least three grams of fish oil per day. And then I, and then I recommend uh, to get your omega-6 essential fats, your GLA, evening primrose oil. I make a product called Omegalyze from Species Nutrition. A lot of you guys out there take it. It's three grams of fish oil, 2,600 milligrams of primrose oil per day. Uh, we also put some omega-7 palmitoleic acid in there, which is not only, it's not necessarily an essential fatty acid, but it's a great insulin sensitizer, and it reduces total body inflammation. And that's important, you know, for good health and for preventing your body from getting these chronic uh, degenerative uh, inflammatory diseases, cancer, arthritis, heart disease later in life. So... Um, those are your three most important, I would say. Multivitamin mineral, vitamin D, essential fatty acids. I would put in the top four also a dual fiber supplement, meaning a fiber that comes from both uh, soluble and insoluble fiber, and the soluble fiber you want to get in the way of psyllium, okay, because it's much more potent than other, uh, other soluble fibers. You do those four, you got all your bases covered pretty much. Over 50, you might want to put a little CoQ10 in there, 100 milligrams a day. Not too bad. Uh, as we get older, our CoQ10 levels decrease a lot. Probably not imperative, if, you, if but the other four being much more important. But I like to add a CoQ10 into that mix. Now, anything else you take on top of that, whether it be whey protein or amino acid, branch chain amino acids, that's all icing on the cake. Those are luxury items. Those first four uh, supplements I told you, imperative. NVO underscore JDT. Dave, your take on bodybuilders who smoke cigarettes. Look, any athlete that smokes cigarettes or anything else that they're inhaling into their body, as my dad would say, is not a true athlete. Athletes don't smoke. Athletes don't drink alcohol. That's if you want to be perform at your best. Uh, why you would want to use a supplement, I mean, a supplement, why you want to use a drug, essentially, uh, that would actually hamper performance as an athlete, I don't know. I don't know why anyone in their rational mind would do that. If you want to be your best, you don't do stuff like that. First of all, smoking is like one of the number one causes of, of, of cancer and heart disease, okay? In the, of everything else out there. And alcohol is number two, I believe. So you definitely don't want to do those two things from not only a health perspective, but a bodybuilding perspective. So um, foo-foo on anyone who does smoke. We have a follow-up to that. Now, this is something you answered a few weeks back. Uh, if you want to touch on it lightly, uh, Charles underscore CPT, your opinion of weed use within bodybuilding. Once again, it, it's a drug that hampers performance. Um, it also lowers serum testosterone levels. Now, I know a lot of guys say, well, if you take taken testosterone, what does it matter? Well, it converts more testosterone to estrogen. Um, I'm not a big believer in... in, in in drugs per se when you're trying to maximize your physical performance. If you're at the end of your career and you want to just relax, I have nothing against people who smoke weed on a regular basis. You're asking me if a, if a guy who's trying to become Mr. Olympia should be smoking weed. I say no. You know, I, don't, I, I just don't think it's something that should be done. Now, I know a lot of guys are vaping it now so that they're not getting the negative effects of the smoke into their lungs. Once again, there, there's certainly always a place for marijuana, I guess, medicinally in, in, in the 
in the, in the realm of, uh, of how we function on a daily basis, I don't think that athletes, okay, should be using recreational drugs. Not if you want to maximize performance. You know, when I competed, I was, you know, on the straight and narrow. I got, and I've talked about this before, I got hooked on Nubane for a few years because I, in my mind, convinced myself, and maybe via Dan Duchesne's writings, that, that Nubane would help bodybuilding performance by lowering cortisol output and relaxing you. You know, I think I rationalized that. I, don't, I, I think that probably was one of the, mistake, the only mistakes I really made in bodybuilding. But if you want to be the best athlete out there, you want to be the best bodybuilder, stay away from recreational stuff. Ross Flanagan, 12. Dave, since fatty and amino acids are the only essential nutrients for muscle growth, why wouldn't someone just do a keto-based diet and increase the amount of fats and proteins during an off-season to grow? Here's the reason why, Ross. The reason is that your body, uh, when it engages in high-intensity activity, and that includes weight training, it likes to, and it likes and prefers to use glucose as a fuel source, carbs. Um, it, it, you know, matter of fact, it's really the only thing it can use. So when you're doing high-intensity activity, if you don't eat carbs in your diet, your body will convert amino acids into, into glucose to use that for fuel. So when we're trying to gain muscle, we don't want to have to convert the protein that we're eating into glucose. It's a very inefficient process, okay? And you're going to walk around glycogen depleted, meaning the muscles are going to feel flat all the time. You're not going to get good pumps and contractions in the gym. So off-season, I, I like to give the, my uh, athletes carbs. Not a ton of carbs, but enough carbs to fuel them up so that they have a full glycogen stores and they have enough glucose to help them, you know, get through their workouts. Once again, that doesn't mean that you need to eat a thousand grams of carbs a day, unless of course you have a crazy freaky metabolism like Juan Morel, <laughs> and he might need a thousand grams of carbs a day. Most people fall in the range of anywhere from 150 to, to 300 grams per day. That's usually ideal, I find, for male bodybuilders, you know. Over the uh, over 200 pounds. Um, so, with the use of, of, of or the ingestion of these carbohydrates in in moderate amounts, you will fuel your body, and all that protein and fat you're eating now can get used for building and repairing muscle. If you don't eat enough carbs, and your body has to convert some of the amino acids into glucose, now you're eating. Now you don't have enough protein necessarily to build and repair muscle. You're because you've used some of it up for fuel. We don't want that. That's where the saying carbs spare muscle comes from. They really don't spare muscle, they spare protein and fat is what they do. Jason Taylor training, Dave, four guys I'm curious about going into the Olympia are Brandon Curry, Michael Lockett, Cedric McMillan, and Nathan Diasha, where they'll be called out and placed. In my mind, they're guys that exhibit great lines, muscle bellies, and insertions. All four have somewhat, quote unquote, broke out with at least one IFBB win, each to their credit, if not more, in the last 12 months. Your thoughts on, I'll repeat it again, Brandon Curry, Michael Lockett, Cedric, and Nathan. I think Michael Lockett's going to have a lot of trouble in the Olympia lineup because his, he doesn't, his legs are, are lacking. You know, he's got a great upper body. His conditioning is always amazing. I think in the Olympia lineup, he will have trouble because of those legs. I think Brandon Curry is probably the biggest wild card. Um, how will he stack up against the Olympia lineup is going to be a lot different than how he stacked up against New Zealand and, and Australia. So that'll be interesting to see how he looks on that stage. I still think he's going to fall into that probably top eight group, probably more towards the eight, seven, six, uh, you know, uh, placings. Nathan Deesh is definitely going to move up from last year. Uh, where he falls, I think he'll be in that same Brandon Curry territory. Um, but he's a guy who definitely will be a top five Olympian at some point in the future. Whether it happens this year or not, I don't know. I'm not sure. Cedric is the guy who we all want to see bring his best to the Olympia stage because we know here's a guy who can compete pretty much against anyone in that lineup. He's got the height. He's got the structure. He's got the posing finesse. Will he bring fullness and conditioning at the same time? That's the question. Will he bring that Arnold Classic look that we saw when he won earlier in the year? If he does that... We got a show on our hands, okay? If he doesn't, which has been his his history in that Olympia, he always comes in too flat, or he doesn't make it to the stage because he gets sick. Then he could be out of the top six for certain. So I think it's very important for Cedric to really focus on this show as being one of the most important of his career, because if he doesn't make that top six here, uh, I think that his stock goes way way down. So it's a shame if he doesn't, because I think he has the tool set to be a top three Olympian. 
Good one here from Benedu14 with the Olympia coming up in so many of the the back to back to back shows. Do you have any tips for when flying before a bodybuilding competition? You know, it's hard for me to give advice. I, I'm of the I'm the kind of guy when I fly, I I get dehydrated, so I get dry, 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 dry. Other guys fly and they get they turn into water balloons. I t I'll tell you one thing that happens to everyone: when you fly, you get constipated. No doubt about it, because you're sitting in a seat for a long period of time. The most important thing you can do is is, is I don't know if all these guys out there in the Olympia line have used fiber supplement, but you want to take your fiber regular. Because you want your body to keep continue functioning. If you take fiber, it doesn't matter if you sit in a seat for 12 hours. You'll still go to the bathroom. And that's important. Because if your bowels back up, you start retaining fluid. And then you get off the plane. You're constipated. You, your stomach is hanging out. You can't, you can't suck a vacuum in. You feel terrible. Big mistake. Um, people tell me, should you overdrink, underdrink, don't eat sodium, do eat sodium. I say, eat the way you've been eating. Don't change anything because you're going on that airplane. Just make sure you take a fiber supplement like Fiberlize twice a day. Ask Guy Cisternino. He does it. He never, misses a, he never misses a day. He travels all the time. He has no problem. Okay? The fiber will be the great equalizer. Let's go to Garth Michael. Your thoughts on L-carnitine off-season and during prep. Also, what doses and timing would you recommend? Look, L-carnitine is, is the carrier that, that transports long-chain fats into the mitochondria of the muscle cell to be metabolized for fuel, okay, or oxidized for energy. Taking more L-carnitine doesn't necessarily mean you're going to burn more fat. It's just ensuring that you have enough transporter. Now, if, you're, if you have a deficiency of L-carnitine in your body and you take a supplemental form of it, you will see more fat burning. If you don't have a deficiency of it, taking more does not necessarily mean you'll burn more fat. Um, is it a good idea to take L-carnitine? Yeah, because you know what? If you are deficient, then, then you're restoring that deficiency. And that's why I put it in my lipolyzed fat burner. Uh, but devouring tons and tons of liquid L-carnitine, injectable L-carnitine, oral L-carnitine is not going to make you burn fat better. You have to understand that distinction. Sort of a follow-up to the earlier question about social media, Yabinov79 wants to know, isn't social media sort of an enemy to top bodybuilders, especially final weeks before the Olympia? How could you focus on tr training with a cameraman following you around? Well, if the cameraman is following you around, it makes it easy. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything. Just let him follow you around and, <laughs> and be yourself. Trying to film yourself, you know, uh, you know with, a, with a selfie thing, a selfie stick, uh, is, is definitely going to be distracting. If I were competing today and nowadays, I wouldn't be doing anything. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even have my phone. I'd probably leave my phone in the car the last couple weeks. Because I remember when I would compete the last four weeks, people would call me on the phone. I wouldn't even want to answer the phone. I, I didn't want to talk to anyone. I, did, I was so irritable all the time. I just wanted to be left alone. I, as soon as I got back from the gym doing my workout and my cardio, I would sit on the couch literally most of the time or on my computer uh, and I would just watch TV and I would eat my meals and between my meals I might fall asleep and take a nap or I try to keep myself busy cleaning the house, organizing things. I didn't want to be bothered by anyone. Now if someone was following me around with a camera, I, I wouldn't necessarily have a problem. It might be annoying but you know I wouldn't be having them do it all day for me but you know if they wanted to follow me to the gym and, and have me film a few meals for you know in that sense, it wouldn't bother me but I would not want to be doing social media. I probably wouldn't post at all for the last four weeks. George JRX, your opinion on GH Fragman and what's the best protocol in terms of effectiveness? Apparently, it's needed on an empty stomach, ideally before cardio. Your thoughts? All the growth hormone releasing peptides work very similarly. They mimic the hormone um, GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone. It's released from the, from the hypothalamus in the brain. That GHRH stimulates the pituitary to release GH, growth hormone. The GHRP6 is GHRP2, CJC, uh, uh, the CJCs, the hexarelins, the MK277s or 677s, whatever. I'm, I might be screwing it up a little bit. All these GH releases do the same thing. They act like GHRH. They tell the pituitary produce, produce growth hormone. 
Um, the environment with which they do it in really doesn't affect how much GH is released. So you really could take them anytime and get the same effect. The question is how much growth hormone will you produce or release from your pituitary given a dosage of, this, of these, of these uh, GH releasers, these uh, peptides? Everyone's different. Some guys will take these, these peptides and get tremendous growth hormone output. Some people will take them and get none. So for some people, you'll hear them rave about these, these, uh, these growth hormone releasing peptides. And then other people say, what the hell are these guys talking about? I took it, I got nothing from it. It's not that one's fake and one's not, it's just that everyone's body responds differently. That's why real growth hormone is way better than these releasers because you don't have to depend on your body releasing the GH, you're actually injecting it. So if, if I inject two IUs of GH and the guy next to me injects two IUs and the guy on the other side of me injects two IUs, we're both all getting the same two IUs of growth hormone in our body. Uh, how our bodies respond to it could be different, but we're, at least we know we're getting a certain quantitative amount of GH. And that's where these peptides fall short. Not everyone responds to them that well. Gain Mac, is it okay to use insulin for a full 16 week cycle post workout or should it be used for a less period of time? Once again, depends on the person. Not everyone should be taking insulin because some people take insulin and get fat from it. People who don't get fat from it and who respond and grow well, those people can take insulin the whole off season if they want. Insulin is not toxic in and of itself. And if anything, it's not going to make you diabetic. It's going to prevent you from becoming diabetic because insulin, if you take it exogenously, will, will reduce the load of insulin that your body naturally has to produce. So there's really no negatives to taking insulin other than the fact that you might get fat from it, you know? Malty Beckman, does Dave recommend apple cider vinegar before each meal of the day or only in the morning before breakfast? or how often daily in general? For good health purposes and for alkalinizing the body, you know, I say take a tablespoon of Bragg's apple cider vinegar and eight ounces of water, you know, anywhere from, anywhere from one to five times a day. If you're very acidic and you have like acid reflux and, and stuff like that, you might want to use it five times a day. For, uh, for a person who's just starting it and wants to get a little detoxification out of it, and a little alkalinization, do it three times a day. If you've done it you know, for a long time and you feel good, maybe just do it once a day for, for maintenance. Sometimes like, I'll go out to eat at night with my wife and, and, and I'll come back and I get like, a little bit of like, you know, I'm tasting maybe the, uh, the garlic or the onions in the food I just ate and I'll just take a shot of it and I'll put it in eight ounces of water and I'll drink it down or I'll add it to my fiber lye shake and my, anything that's coming up on me instantly goes away. Um, and I use it like that at night you know, before I go to bed. So I don't always remember to take it. But I've used it continuously for so long that I'm probably pretty alkaline on, on a basis. Plus, I drink alkalinized water from the, from the alkalinized water filters that I sell on my, on my actually, it's an alkalinized water pitcher. It's called Santavia. I sell it at DavePaloma.com for 30, I think it's like 45 bucks. Um, so I drink alkalinized water all day or anyway. So, you know, there's different schemes of why you're going to take it. But if you're one of these people that's very acidic, you're breaking out a lot. Uh, you know, that might be something you might want to try the three to five times a day to start and then kind of taper back to a maintenance dose. Exolent 187, Dave, I'm a natural lifter, 188 pounds, and I'm getting ready for a show. I'm an endomorph lifting heavy, six to eight reps, and I'm doing fasted cardio three times a week, but I'm losing mass rapidly, especially in my arms. What can I do from a nutritional standpoint to avoid this? Will increasing protein and dropping carbs very low help. Well, if you're an endomorph, okay, it usually means you don't lose muscle very easily. So you might not be as endo as you think. You might be more meso, you know, or um, in the middle type of thing. Uh, you know, very rarely do I see people lose muscle on a diet unless they have a ridiculously fast metabolism. If you're not burning through fat and your body fat's not really low, you're probably not losing muscle. You might be deflated a little bit and your glycogen stores may be low, but you're probably not losing muscle. Um, I don't know how much protein and fat and carbs you're eating or, or what your, you know, necessarily, you know, your weight is, but I always say if you feel you're losing muscle, bump protein up a little bit. If you're eating no fat in your diet, that could be the problem too. You might want to put some more essential fatty acids in there. Try an essential fatty acid supplement like my uh, Omega Lies. Uh, take in some macadamia nut oil for essential fats in your diet, but you got to work through those macros. I can't just give you, hey, do this, do this, do this, because I don't know what else you're eating. You know, I'm not doing a customized diet for you here. Um, so 
you know, if you're telling people who tell me, oh, my arms look like they're getting small because I'm on a diet, or my legs look like they're getting small because I'm on a diet, and those were their weak body parts, usually just means they're glycogen depleted and they, and they don't really like the fact that they don't have as much muscle as they really want in those areas. Let's go to Bobby or Booby Bobby Traplord. I'm going to start cycling and plan a 16 week one to start. What's the best way to work up being off eight to 12 weeks a year? I'm not really sure. I know he said you're going to be, he wants to know how to go off. Is that what he's asking? I don't, what's the question? How, the best way to work up to being off eight to 12 weeks a year. I'm not really that. I always tell of, people there's really no need to tape or anything because remember a lot of the drugs you're taking are long acting. So, I mean, just stop them. Once you stop the drugs, if the half-life is three weeks to get out of your system, then it'll, they'll taper off. After being off for an entire week, that's when you start your PCT or post-cycle therapy. Starting with HCG, 2,000 units every, every third day for five shots, and then you go to Clomid, 500, uh, 50 to 100 milligrams a day for another two weeks, and then just stay off you know, until your body cleans out, and, and then after 12 weeks, if, if you're good, or 10 to 12 weeks, you want to go back on, you go back on. So there's really no need to taper because of the fact that you're not going to crash in two seconds because these, these, these anabolics are built up in your system for weeks and months and months and months. So they, they take a while to trickle out. So you're not going to get a super crash just by stopping. It's like the guy who tells me I got to go on vacation uh, to Mexico for seven days. What am I going to do? I can't take my shots. Well, in seven days, you know, all the drugs are not going to come out of your system. So don't, don't panic so much. J.S. Brown, 923, during contest prep for someone working an eight to five desk job, would you suggest spreading daily carb intake uh, evenly over six meals or stacking them more closely around the workout? I do fasted cardio before work and train after work. Yeah, I, I don't know why people, uh, why this has come out. It's a lot of bro science out there that, that people saying, oh, you got to eat all your food around your workout, pre-workout, post-workout. Why? Why? Your body can't process all that food in, in, in two huge meals, okay? You, your body's going to metabolize off a lot of these extra calories because you're jamming too much food into these two, into these two meals. Spread it out over the course of the day. Remember, there's no storage facility for protein in your body. That means if you don't eat it every two to three hours, you're going to be in a, in a protein-deprived state. You can't eat all your protein, fat, and carbs in, th in two meals. Likewise, you can't eat all your carbs in two meals, okay? It's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna assimilate well. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna get low blood sugar in the morning and at night when you're not training and eating. And then the rest of the day you're gonna have super high blood sugar, which means you're gonna have tons of insulin release, which is gonna mean you're gonna crash. So spread your food out evenly over the course of the day. Once you figure out what you need, protein, fat, and carb wise, you want to spread it out because and people always ask me, oh, should I not eat five hours before bed or three hours before bed? Why? Your body doesn't know what time it is if you need. 150 or 200 grams of carbs a day to satisfy your energy requirements and to refill glycogen source, what does it matter if you're having 30 of those grams of carbs right before bed? You're not going to store it as fat. It's going to get stored as glycogen. So stop worrying about jamming food into, into two meals. I, I know people that they eat almost all their food in pre and post workout. They take a million insulin units. Uh, they take all their GH, all their drugs then, and, they, and then they don't eat the rest of the day. Or It's so stupid. Spread your stuff out evenly. Jacked and juicy. Is it true that zinc can boost natural testosterone? Does it also help women? Um, zinc deficiencies have been shown to, to lower testosterone levels, but that doesn't mean that taking extra zinc is going to make you produce more testosterone. Once again, it goes back to what I was mentioning earlier. Just because L-carnitine is a fat transporter, doesn't mean it's going to burn fat for you if you have no carnitine deficiency. Same thing with zinc. If you don't have a zinc deficiency because you take a multivitamin like V-Mineralize every single day, taking extra zinc is not going to make you produce more testosterone. It's just not going to happen. Uh, Marcus Mosgar, Dave, love the show. What will you do? I guess he wants to know the advice as far as water intake slash water depletion days leading up to a show. Anyone who's worked with me knows that I don't change anything until the last day before the show. I don't change sodium intake. I don't change water intake. I don't want the body to know what the heck is going on. Once you start altering things and sodium loading and water loading, now your body says something's going on. I, I, I got to stop, put a stop to this. I don't want the body to know what's going on whatsoever. The day before the show, I cut sodium out. 
okay? That acts as a diuretic effect on the body, so the body starts releasing water. Um, I cut fluid intake out at about 8.30 the night before a Saturday morning pre-judging. That allows the body to dry out adequately without over dehydrating. And usually that Friday night, okay, after no sodium the whole day, I might put back a, a, a sodium meal before bed after the person stops drinking. Sometimes I do a burger and french fries. Sometimes I do a clean carb meal with, with salt. And then the next day, I put the salt back in. I let people eat salt, as much salt as they want because they're not drinking the whole day. Um, so that, you know, and, and, and these are just basic guidelines I'm giving you. Everyone's program is, is much more specific for what their goals are, but in a nutshell, that's it. The, I do the least amount of, of manipulation possible only the day before. Same thing with diuretics. I might use a half a diazide or two half diazides on Friday before a Saturday show, and that's it. You don't need to do more than that. You don't need to be taking diuretics for five days leading up to the show. Dehydrating yourself early in the week is only going to cause your body to start resisting what you're doing, and that's what we don't want. Getting a lot of questions on carbs to car 81. What percentage of your carbs and fats during a contest prep can come from fructose and saturated fats? Well, I, I'm a believer in definitely taking in some saturated fat in your diet because Saturated fat contains cholesterol, and cholesterol is the building blocks of all the steroidal hormones in the body. So you definitely need some saturated fat, not a lot, but some. I wouldn't use any fructose in, in my diet whatsoever. Um, we all know, well, if you, any of you have ever watched anything that I've, any interviews I've done with Dr. Scott Connolly or read any of his books, you know, he's an expert in this. But high fructose corn syrup basically takes the fat burning machinery switch and flips it off in your body. So as soon as fructose enters your body, I'm not talking about eating a piece of an apple. I'm talking about high fructose corn syrup. When you put that into your body, it shuts down the fat burning machinery, turns it right off. So you don't want to use simple sugars at all in your diet while you're preparing for competition. If you're going to eat carbs, eat starchy, you know, low glycemic carbs, brown rice, sweet potatoes, oatmeal, you know, and, and I don't have a problem with white rice either, but I wouldn't be eating anything like sugary. Take a couple of quick questions here. There are a lot of good questions coming in today. Uh, are Schrock fit your prime years age-wise for the most muscle growth? That's part one of the question. And part two is how long should one compete naturally before using enhancements? I would say 24 to 28 are, are the best growth years because when you're in your early 20s, your metabolism is really fast, so it's sometimes hard to put on a lot of mass. Now, everyone, there's always the genetic freak out there that can do it, but I found that when I hit about 24, 25, that's when I slowed down just enough and my body really, those were my real peak growth years. And I put on the most size during those, those four or five years. So that to me is, is, is probably, you know, that's why when I see Dallas McCarver and he's only 25 years old and he's so big, I'm like, this guy's going to continue growing for the next three years. It's, it, it's, almost, it's, it's almost unimaginable what he's going to look like. Um, now the other question, Sid, was what again? Uh, how long should one compete naturally oh, before using right. enhancements? That's a personalized thing. You know, I, I don't think anyone under the age of 18 should use anabolic steroids whatsoever. Uh, I think it's, it's foolish. I don't even think, I waited until I was 22. Um, I think that what you should do is try to maximize your gains as a natural athlete before you start putting drugs into the equation. What does that mean? That means learn how to eat, learn how to train. Once your training is maximized and your eating and supplementation is optimized and you can't gain an, an, another pound of muscle because you've maximized everything you can possibly do naturally, that's when you should consider using anabolic steroids because at that point, your body has well-trained muscle and we all know that anabolic steroids respond way better to well-trained muscle than they do to immature muscle. Take Kai Green, for instance. He was a natural athlete for many years before he added in drugs. And there's other athletes out there, Ronnie Coleman, another example. When you put anabolic steroids into the equation of someone who has well-trained muscle, and I was one of these same people. You know, when I took my first cycle, I put on 10, 12 pounds of solid muscle in eight weeks because my body was so primed to grow. I just, I just needed more stimulus there that I wasn't getting naturally. Take one more from Max Stenix. Your preferred method of peaking a bodybuilder a day out from competition, do you fat load since you're the godfather of bodybuilding keto, I've also heard you use a slow carbo process at the beginning of the week. So if that's the case, what do you do the night before the contest? Um, I don't usually reintroduce carbs. I'm going to talk about in, in general. Some guys I give carbs to way earlier. 
Usually I do two days of carving, Thursday and Friday. I don't cut fats or protein. I think that's a big mistake. A lot of people cut back their protein, they cut back their, their, their fats, and then they put the carbs in. And what happens is you're basically eating the same amount of calories, if not less, because remember, carbs have way less calories per gram than fat does. So a lot of people wind up, they start eat, they're eating less calories while they're carving up and their metabolism is so fast that they just can't fill themselves up. So I keep protein and fat constant and I just add the carbs to the equation. And that seems to work every time. Now I have athletes who are so lean, you know, the last week before a show they're giving me updates every single day. I might on Tuesday get an update from someone and I'm carb depleting them now and I'm like, wow, they're, they're so freaky hard and flat. And I say, you know what, I want you to go home and have a cheeseburger and fries or I want you to go home and have you know, uh, 35 grams of carbs at your last three meals today. And they're like, what? I'm depleting. I'm like, just do it. And they wake up the next morning even leaner and lighter. So you have to know when to feed the body and when to starve it. And I think that that comes with experience as a coach. It also comes with, you know, learning how the, the science of the body and how it works. And that's, you know, you know, that's a little segue. You know, I teach this course, The Secrets to Becoming a Diet Guru. A lot of people have been, love the course, who've taken it. Um, we have another one coming up September 2nd here in Cape Coral, Florida. If you want to sign up, it's a 10-hour class. You can go to my website at DavePaloma.com. We have two spots left. And, you know, learn the science of what's going on. Learn the science of, of diet and nutrition. Learn the science of supplementation. Learn the science of performance-enhancing drugs. Learn the science of detoxification. You know, it's important that you have the science along with the experience because then you can make the right changes to the person's program and make sure that no matter what the scenario is, they look their best. That's gonna do for this episode of Ask Dave. Reminder right now on rxmuscle.com and the RX Muscle YouTube channel, we had live with Bader Budai, the head of Oxygen Gym in Kuwait. He came on, talked Big Rami, talked about, I guess, his little feud with Chris Cicito and gave us an update on the Oxygen Gym. Athletes are gonna be competing at the Olympia right now, rxmuscle.com and the RX Muscle YouTube channel, live with Bader Budai. For Dave Palumbo and Johnny Stiles, I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.